always has a great privilege to come and be with y'all each and every time we can. And like was mentioned here earlier in the service, we just want to remember Brother Brent and his family that they have a safe trip, that the Lord will bless them, that they may have a safe trip home. And uh, we just ask y'all to be with me in y'all's prayers this morning as we try to get the thoughts that the Lord's placed on our heart, that the Spirit of God can take it to the heart, and that we could all receive a blessing. So if you have your Bibles this morning, let's start off in Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. Verse 12. This is where we're going to start, but uh, if you want to go ahead and turn to 2 Kings chapter 5, that's where we'll be headed. So we're going to start off in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. Then jump over to 2 Kings in chapter 5. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the waves of death. You know, what, what man is good at, what we're all good at, is uh, having preconceptions, having having things already figured out in our lives, having things per se planned out that the way they should go. But the way of the world, it seems pleasant at first. It seems right. The way of the world says, if it feel good, do it. That's very attractive. But the Bible says that uh, God's ways are higher in our ways and His thoughts are way above our thoughts. That uh, a lot of times we have thoughts that are not right, thoughts that go contrary to the Word of God. Because if we think about it from a natural sense, from a man's sense of uh, where he's at, is uh, that uh, he's consumed in materials. Materials. You know, I think about over, I believe it's in Luke chapter 12 or 13, over there somewhere, it talks about, we all know the parable very well, Whereas there was this rich man that had plenty. His ground done very good. And uh, he had more than he needed. And the man said, I thought within, uh, he said, the parable goes, he thought within himself that what shall I do with all this abundance? What shall I do with all the things that God's blessed me with? He didn't say God's blessed me with the, the bountiful thing that he had. He said, this is what I'll do. His thought was, I have excess Let's help out the poor and let's help out the needy. No, his thoughts were, hey, let me tear down my barns, these old small barns, and let's build these greater barns. And, and there, that way, I don't have to work. I can just eat and drink and be merry and not have to have no recollection of what's going on that I am settled. But the Lord comes to him and says, you know, thou fool, thy soul has been required of thee. And all that stuff that you've gathered up, all that stuff that you have, all the material things of this life, they're going to belong to. You know, his thought to life was, get it while you can. Get all that you can. And the way is, and if the, the person that doesn't believe in God or doesn't believe in a, in a life after death, that's their mentality. That's the carnal man. The temporary man, get all what you can because time's running out. We're put here to enjoy this life for a brief moment. Then after, and after it's all said and done, it's over. And that would seem right to a lot of people. That would seem right. That way is very attractive. You know, that way of, of get all that we can, strive to, to, to get all the money you can in the world, Try to strive to have all the power you can, strive to, to get to the top of the ladder, That seems right, don't it? That, that seems because that's, that's what we're, in the culture that we live in, that's what we're taught, you know, get it, get it, get it while you can. If, if time is money and money is time, so if, you're, if we're wasting time, we're wasting opportunity, and that, that's, that's the thought of the world today. But there's a bunch of ways it seems right unto man. You know, Jesus talks about, in Matthew chapter 7, that there were two gates. One was narrow, 
and one was broad. It talks about two trees. One produced fruit and one didn't produce. It produced bad fruit. Then he goes on down and talks about two foundations. There was a foundation that was built. The foundation was the rock and the other, the other foundation was the sand. But what we have here is, is what we're trying to get across this morning. Is there's ways that seems right that's truly not right. And uh, the Bible says there's only one way. There's only one way to be saved. There's only one way to become a part of the kingdom of God. There's only one way to be joint heirs with Christ, with Christ Jesus. There's only one way to, to get to heaven. There's only one way to enjoy the eternal bliss of heaven. And that way is Jesus Christ. And any other way, it's a false way. Any other way says, because you can just break it all down to pretty much two categories. There's grace through faith. And then there's human achievement. And human achievement says, well, I can be good enough to work my way, I can build me a ladder or I can build me a bridge on my good works, on the things that I can give God and I can make myself worthy that God will forgive us. Worthy that, that He can pass me up because I'm just that good. Well, first off, that He doesn't have the right opinion of Himself, does, does He? You know, we, we hear this, you know, hear sometimes people say, and, you know, why do we sin? Why does a sinner sin? Do we sin because we're sinners? We're all sinners, aren't we? But there's one way, and we can come up with these preconceptions or these notions. That's not the right way. So let's go over to uh, 2 Kings real quick. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit scattered this morning, but we're just trying to get it all, get it all what it entails to do. You know, we went to, uh, we went to Utah last week, and my wife says, Travis, you need to put on sunscreen. And every time you get to the, the place where he says, when you say, I thought, usually something negative has happened. Well, I thought it would work out this way, but it didn't. I told Haley, I don't need no sunscreen. Sunscreens are for sissies. So we get out on that boat, and uh, we're going to see the, uh, what's it called, the, the, rainbow, the rainbow Bridge over on Lake Powell. And it's a three-hour boat ride there, and it's a three-hour boat ride back. Well, me, I'm going to get up there. They had a little enclosed cabin on, in the bottom of the boat, but on top of the boat, you know, it was open, and there was chairs up there. I says, well, I want to see the lake. I ain't sitting in there. I'm going to sit up on the top. Three hours go by, and we're in this boat, and we're, 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 trying, to, we're trying to get to the, to the little dock place where we can walk about a, a quarter of a mile to see this, to, to see this cool-looking rock. But on the way back, you know, we get there, and the sun's baking now. It's about 12 o'clock. We're on the way back, and I mean, I am, I am burning up. My skin's getting hot. Got off that boat and says, well, I, I thought I didn't need that sunscreen. Yes, and that's the negative, and, and that's what we're trying to get there. Is there, there, there our, our thoughts can sometimes get us in trouble, and if we have to say, well, I thought it would work out, or I thought, it usually entails of something negative that's just happened. So let's go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, and this is a very, very familiar story that we all know. It was about a man that thought he knew or a preconsumption on how, how he should be healed. So let's pick it up in verse 1. Now, Naaman, captain of the host of the king of uh, Syria, was a great man with his masters and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. And he was also a mighty man in valor but he was a leper. 
You know, here you have Naaman. Now, Naaman, he was a, he was a great man. You know, let's just look at the characteristics of Naaman from, from a natural sense. He was the captain of the Syrian army. You know, he, he had position. He, he had authority. You know, he, he had zeal. He, he, he was a man that, that in, in, in most people's eyes that stood head and shoulders above each other man. He was a man of prominence. He, he was a man that, that had great respect not only from the king, but from the people that ranked under him. He, he was a very elevated man in society. There's a lot of times people are elevated in this life, and I'm not saying that all elevation is bad, but this was a man who was elevated in his life. He, he, he'd done many great things. He was a man of power. He was a very esteemed man. But the truth of the matter is, he was a leopard. You see, as, as we grow up in this life, and the young people, as we, as we grow up in this life, we have, we have light set before us. We have, so many, we have so much potential in this life. We have so many options that we can go or what to go or what to do. And we can climb up the ladder in this life, per se, and have all that we can. And, and all that we, that, that, that we, we grab all that we, we can. But the truth of the matter is, no matter how great this man was, no matter how much that he had, no matter how much power, respect, or honor, or, or all the things that he came up with in this life, but what? But he was a leper. He had a disease. He had something that within himself that he couldn't overthrow. He had something within himself that, that, that he couldn't get rid of. It was an awful disease. It was, a, it was a skin disease. And he had a problem. Anybody that doesn't know Jesus Christ in this world has a problem. And that problem is what? They stand guilty before Almighty God. They stand guilty, they, they stand there guilty in their sin because I tell you like this, sin is a terrible cancer, isn't it? You see people that have cancer and they just wither away and they wither away and they dry up. That's what sin does. What does sin do to people? Sin destroys. What does sin bring? Sin brings death. You know, the, the over the, what sin equals, it always equals death. So he had a problem he was a great man, but yet he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away a captive out of the land of Israel, a little maiden. And she waited on Naaman's wife. So here they are. They, Naaman set out to say raid, raids, and, and they go and raid the uh, Israel, and they're, they're, they're grabbing treasure, and they're, 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 they're looting the place, and they come across this little maiden. You know, it's real easy for us to read through this real quick and just miss over this little maiden. And her job was to wait on Naaman's wife. But this little girl, or however old she was, even though these people has came and, and ripped her up out of her homeland, her world has been turned upside down, that there she is in this foreign country with these foreign people, people she didn't know, people that's done ugly to her, people that's misused her, people that abused her, people that, 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 that did all things against her. What does this little girl do? You know, society says that, well, if somebody hits you, you hit them back, right? But what does Jesus say? Those who persecute you, bless them. Though those who do you wrong, you do them right. Those that, that, that persecute you because it's so easy in our lives to get to the place where, where it's easy for us to treat people good that treat us good, don't it? But, but what does that render anything? How does that help the situation? What, what, what we as Christians, we're supposed to be distinct, aren't we? We're supposed to be separated from the world. And so if we go acting like the world in these circumstances, what, what's much better? Because anybody can love anybody that loves them. But Christ says, you, do you love them anyway? They persecute you, you love them anyway. So this little girl here, this little handmaiden, she must have seen that Naaman's wife was grieving. First off, she seen there was a problem. And she had faith in her Lord. She had faith in her God. She knew who her God was. And she said unto her missus, would God, my Lord, were, 
were with the prophet that was in Samaria, for he will recover him of his leprosy. You know, a lot of times we see people out there that, that's, 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 that, that's broken hearted. We see people that's downtrodden. We see people that have, that have a rough way of life. We see people that, that no doubt needs help. We see people that needs Jesus. And what do we tell them? Do, do we just try to brush them off and say, well, we're praying for you and just leave it alone at that? Or how many times do we, we, we go out of our way to spend time with them to encourage them, to encourage them to come to the house of the Lord, encourage them there's a better way of life, encourage them that we belong to a God that loves us and he takes care of us and you can become one of his children and, and so you, you bring him into the fold and he says here, but she says, you know, I know a man that is empowered by God that could heal this man's leprosy she had faith in her God, she knew who her God was, even though she was torn out of her place, even though she was torn out of everything that she's ever known, she believed her God, and she didn't render evil from evil, but she rendered good for evil, and we'll see that God is being going to be put on display here in a little bit. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maiden that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go <coughs> to go, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. You know, Naaman must have been pretty important to this king. Like we said earlier, this, this man had great respect. This man had, 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 had great opportunities. This man had great privileges. When, when the king goes out of his way and says, listen, you got a problem? You know, there's a solution here. I'm going to send you and you go. You know, the king must have had a lot of respect for Naaman. And he departed and took with him 10, 10, 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of raiment. He sent him off with a letter saying, hey, this is Naaman. So with some documents. And not only that, he, he sent a bunch of money. He, he, he sent a bunch of equity. He, he sent a... He, he, he wasn't playing around. He, he, he seriously wanted Naaman to get the treatment that he needed. And he brought after the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when the letter is come unto thee, behold, I have wherewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou might recover him of his leprosy. And that's, that's what the note was saying. That's what the letter was saying. And so they send it to the king of Israel. So how does the king of Israel respond? And it came to pass, the king of Israel read the letter and ran his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make a, to make alive, that this man do send me to recover a man of leprosy. Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how thou seekest quarrel against me. He took this letter the wrong way, didn't he? You know, he thought that, here we're getting back to our thoughts, he thought that, that this was a trick or this was a trap or he thought that, hey, they're sending something over here. They, they know I can't, they know that I can't heal him. They know I can't do this. But, but what he thought was that they were trying to come quarrel against him, that they were trying to get a war started, you know, making this wild assumption that the king could, 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 heal, could heal this leprosy on Naaman. And so he got all out of sorts. He's got all out of whack. And when we as God's people, when we get out of sorts and out of whack, we, it's, it's hard for us to be a blessing to people if we don't have our hearts and minds centered on the purpose that God has us for here. And when we understand and realize is, is that, yes, there's going to be instances where we have no power over. Just like somebody coming to know, to know the Lord Jesus Christ, can you save that person? We can't. And we can get all in a, in a, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a burden for the lost people. But we put it in the Lord's hands, don't we? And so he got all out of his way. And so it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel and rent his clothes that he sat to the king saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me and he shall know that I am that there is a prophet in Israel. So the king there, he was in anguish. He, he, got to a, he got between a rock and a hard place and he didn't know which way to go. But ain't it good to know when you got somebody that's close to the Lord in your lives and you, you've, you've got 
you've got this huge problem. And to you, it seems like the end of the world. But they can come in and, and say a few words and pray for you. And they don't, these people don't let the situation overcome their faith in the Lord. But as we move on here, so Naaman came his horse. So, let's see, let's go back up. So Elisha says, listen, you got a problem sending to me. Send, send Naaman to me and we'll, we'll fix this. So Naaman came with the horses and his chariots and stood at the, door, at the house of Elijah. Now, could you imagine Naaman? You know, could you imagine the convoy that he, that he had behind him? You know, I could imagine that, yes, that, that, that hey, this, this man was somebody... The, the chariot was probably nice and he probably had men outside the chariot. You know, this was a man of respect. This was a man of honor. This was a man that, that, that what he wants that he gets. And so he comes there and he comes to Elijah's door. What does Elijah do? Elijah didn't even come out there to see him. Elijah sent a messenger. He sent a servant and he says, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and in the end thy flesh shall become a, thy flesh shall again Come to thee, and thou shalt be clean. That was very simple and straightforward, wasn't it? That was the command. Naaman, you want to be healed? This is what you do. You go to the Jordan, and you dip seven times. That's it. But Naaman was wroth, and he went his way. You know, suppose that you had a mysterious and fatal disorder or disease. And it was recommended to you a skillful doctor. A doctor that knew what he was talking about. Would you expect to see the doctor's mode of action before you got there? Would you, would, you, would you already have it pretty much in your mind that, hey, this is what he's going to do? And then when he gives you that advice or, or that treatment that, that you say, hey, this is the disease, this is how we treat it, and this is, this is how this is going to be fixed. But you hesitate to accept his advice. My question is, why even go to the doctor if you're going to hesitate the, the, the advice that the doctor gives you. Why even go to the doctor and you ask yourself the question, well, if you go to the doctor and you don't like what they tell you or you don't like the, 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 the remedy they got for this, for this mysterious and, 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 and fatal disease that you do have and you go to the doctor and he's the one that's got the answer, he's the one that's got the way and you go there with, with the thought of how it should be played out and it doesn't play out how you think it should be played out, what's the point going to the doctor? Why not heal yourself? And, and, that's, and that's, what he, that's what we get at. But Naaman was wroth and he went his way because he had in his own idea, in his own mind, how he should be healed from his leprosy. You know, a lot of times if you're here and lost, You've been, you've been told and people, you've heard, you have heard testimonies of how people feel and, and how, you know, how people you know, come about. And, when, you're, and we, when you come to Christ and you're expecting to have some kind of a feeling, you're expecting to have some kind of emotion, you have preconceptions of what salvation should be. So therefore, if you're not putting your trust in Christ, what are you doing? You're putting your faith and trust in a feeling. You're putting your faith and trust in an emotion that you still be feeling. You know, you're putting your assurance in how you feel. You know, he was putting his assurance, he had his mind made up as, is that he was going to come over there and wave his hand around him and say and be healed. He thought it was going to be some extravagant thing that happened to him. His, his thoughts were wrong but what got in Nahum's way and what gets in the lost sinner's way is he had a problem with his ego. He had pride. Pride has sprang up in his heart. You just think about this man. He, he was exalted among 
among men. He had power. He had authority. He was he he he, he had he had he had, he was esteemed. And he comes to this old this old Elijah's shack, and he he's he's out there, and he's got he's got all this riches with him. He's brought all this money. He's he's sent by the king. He's somebody. Now I want I want some service. I need some respect. You know this is how I think you should say. Or this is how I think you should have cleansed me. But he but he got mad when he says that no that's not the way. This is the way. Or not Abana and far far rivers of Damascus better than the waters of Israel. So he starts to question the way that. Uh, pretty much the Lord says, this is how you do it. This is how you're going to be clean. This is how you're going to become white as snow. This is how that you're going to get rid of this leprosy. This is how. This is the way. He says, I know some rivers back home that are way cleaner than the Jordan River because the Jordan River was muddy. And so we turn and went away in, went away in rage. He went through all this effort to get clean. He went through all this effort. And this is what his servants remind him. And his servant came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, would thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he said to thee, Wash and be clean. You know, his servant, his servant pointed out to him, he says, You know what, Naaman? You would have been willing to do anything, the hardest thing, anything that was set before you, no matter how hard it was, no matter where you had to go. If you had to go climb to the top of, the, of a mountain to be clean, you would have been clean. But this simple thing, why not do it? How much rather, rather than when he said to thee, wash and be clean. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like the flesh of a child and he was clean. We all know and realize that a baptism doesn't save nobody. We know that. But the issue here the point of this is obedience. Because what does true faith produce? Always. True faith produces obedience. If you believe something, truly believe something, then you act on it, don't you? You take, you, you, you take it at what it is, and then you apply it. You believe it. You put your trust, you put your faith in that. See, the issue was not the quality of the water. It wasn't the water that made him, that, that made him better. It was the power of God that made him better. And it was, it was him being in obedience to the word of God is what, is what cleansed this man. So if you're here and you're lost this morning, there's a lot of different thoughts that you can have about salvation and, and what it truly means to be saved or how do you be saved or or, and, you, and you can get yourself so much entangled in your preconceptions of, of what you think or, or how it should feel. When the, Lord, when, when the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved, I just don't get no more clearer than that, does it? And what it is is taking God at His word. So if you're here and you're lost today, know one thing, that God loves you. How do we know that God loves you? He sent His only begotten Son in the world to do what? To do what for you? To die for you. Was we worthy that Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, would come down here and die for me and you, me and you? Was we worthy for His precious blood to be shed for us? 
We are all, we're all unworthy. And that's the thing about it is we have, to, we have to humble ourselves down as children. We have to humble ourselves down, get pride, get ego, get thoughts, get what we think out of the way and come open. And just like the song that we sang this, that at the close of the song service, just as I am without one plea, because the truth is Naaman came here. He was ready to offer, he was ready to offer a bunch of money to, 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 to get healed, but, that, but he didn't take the money. He, but, but that wasn't the way that he got healed. We, we don't get healed by saying that we don't get saved what we have to offer God because in reality, what do we truly have to offer God? We have zero. We have nothing. When we get to the point in our lives and realize that our faith, or our righteousness is as what? Our righteousness is as filthy rags before God Almighty. We can sit there and say, Lord, if you'll do this for me, I'll give you this. Or Lord, if, I'll give this to you if you do this for me. But to come to the place and realize is that, that you're a sinner and that you have no hope, that you are spiritually, spiritually bankrupt, that you are hopeless, that you are blind, that you are naked, and that you have nothing to give God. That's why they call it mercy, and that's why they call it grace, is because God looked down on you with mercy, and he looked down on the sinner with mercy, and sent his son into this world to do what? To live the life that you couldn't live, that I couldn't live, no matter how much hard we tried, we can't live up to the holy standard that God has called us to, and if any man thinks that, he's desperately wrong, his eyes are blinded, his ego's in his way, his pride's in his way, because who are the people that need saving? The people that, that, that are saved or do become saved are the people that realize that, hey, I'm sick, I, I've got this horrible disease, I am separated from God Almighty, and there's only one way for me to get to God, and that's through Jesus Christ, and it involves you, you repenting of your sins and turning and trusting in Jesus Christ, because why? Because Jesus Christ is a substitutionary he was a substitution for you. He died in your place. He died in my place. And that we could have life eternal. That we could have be that we could be made right with God. That we can be joined heirs with him. Because all about Jesus Christ, and that's what we're trying to get at this morning, is being obedient to God's word and God's way of salvation. He says, Not come unto him unless the Father calls him. Not be is brought before God unless unless the Father calls him. But there's only one way to get to the Father. And what way is that? There's only one door to go through. There's only one way to go. And that way is Jesus Christ. Because and it's a sad thing when people reject Jesus Christ. Because what they're rejecting is God's greatest gift to this world. What they're rejecting is God's, is God's love, God's grace, God's tender care, his, his, his affection, His love towards you. And that's a dangerous thing to do. And to realize that God has a way. Are we willing to push, to, to, to put ourselves to the side and realize that we can't give nothing God, that our thoughts aren't God's thoughts, that our ways aren't God's ways, that we're people most miserable, that we have no way out, and to, this, is the, this is where it really gets serious here, is as well, what happens if I don't trust in the Lord Jesus Christ now? What happens if I don't be saved? What happens if I'm not obedient to the gospel call? What happens if I don't put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and that's, a, and that's a very serious question and it's something that you all we all have to come to grips with the, the reality of what it means when people reject Jesus Christ what's well, eternity they'll lift their eyes up in hell with no opportunity the opportunity is gone they'll be there in hell and lift their eyes up there and they'll spend their, the rest of their lives the rest of their days eternity in a place called hell where the, where the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched there is no mercy down there there is no way out of hell and but all simply because well, I thought of a better way or I thought that this was the way a lot of people is going to stand before the Lord one day and say well I I thought I believed in you, Lord. I thought I was a part of your kingdom because if we go back over to Matthew chapter 7 and we read in verse 21, it says, in that day, what day is that? That's the judgment day where people's going to stand before the Lord and give an account and they're going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment and say, haven't we done all these great, great and mighty things in your name? We, we, we've, we, we've prophesied, we've preached, we've cast out devils, we've done all these great and marvelous things in your name name, you know, and what is Jesus going to say to him? He's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. 
You see, they thought that the way to God, they thought that the way to heaven was, was, was their righteousness or, or, or their, own, their own way, their own works. But they're going to stand before the Lord and say, well, and that's, and that's the, going to be the most awful I thought ever in my life, in, in anybody's life, when they says, well, I thought I knew the way. I thought that that was the way for me to go. I thought by my goodness that I could, that I could outweigh the good and the bad. But it's going to be too late then. It's going to be too late. And he's going to say, depart from me for I never knew you. And he goes on down there. He says there was people that built two houses. There was people that built two houses on two different foundations. One built on the rock and one built on the sand. And as they got there and they're building their houses. But this is the thing about it is. They, they all build, they're both building a house. But the, the foundations are different. But the judgment that, come, that is coming is the same. There was both a storm. There was a storm coming that was going to hit both of them houses. But whose house stood firm. It was the one that was built on the rock. It was the one that trusted in Jesus Christ that's going to be able to weather the storm of judgment because what's all it going to amount to and what determines your eternity is what do you do with Jesus Christ? And that's the question I want to ask you this morning is what are you going to do with the one called Jesus? I pray this morning that you'll humble yourself down acknowledge who you are, acknowledge where you're going, and crying out for mercy that the Lord will save you. And He will. We just pray that we don't stand before the Lord one day. I don't want to hear. I don't want to see anybody stand before the Lord one day and says, "I thought, I thought." We can have our business straight now. We don't have to say "I thought." We can say "We know," because we take God at His word, don't we? We take God at His word, and we're obedient to His word. And the, the Lord says, "Hey, if this is what you do, we do, and we we have our trust and faith in what God said." So I pray that you will trust in the Lord while you have time and opportunity. And us as God's people. If we're not careful, we'll be like Naaman. We'll have our whole lives planned out. We'll, we'll have an idea of this is where the church needs to go. We'll have the idea of where, of how things should be set up. I pray that we never get too confident in ourselves or, get, or let ego take us over and say, hey this, hey, this is the way. But always be, hey, this is, what the, this is what the Bible says. Because we can stand assured to know that God's way is the right way. But to go God's way, what do, you, what do we have to do? We have to become submissive, don't we? We have to yield. We have to become small. We, 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 have, to, we have to give up our ways and our thoughts and our intentions and get our lives lined up God's way and the Lord will bless us. This will be the message the Lord's placed on our heart.